so thank you. Um, interesting uh, presentations that we have uh, listened to, and I think they are going to make this presentation much easier for you to comprehend and uh, um, benefit from. So, um, you know, there is a spectrum of fungal disease in the sinuses, and uh, when you go uh, looking into the non-invasive ones, then you can start with the saprophytic, saprophytic the mycetoma, where you have no inflammatory disease to the fungal growing in the sinuses, and then allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, where you have, when you have an allergic response to uh, the fungi in the sinuses, and then you have the invasive ones, uh, acute, chronic, and the chronic granulomas invasive, and there was a term in the 90s that was, ter you know, the term was referred to as the semi-invasive when they looked into the those extensive allergic fungal rhinosinusitis cases when they felt like, well, that's, that must, must be something that's really invasive. So they called it semi-invasive. But then, you know, by the time we have understood better what's the pathology in, in these um, scenarios, now we understand this is just an extensive allergic fungal rhinosinusitis case um, just uh, that Amin was talking about, you know, the, the, such kind of cases, uh, but these cases require endoscopic uh, management and uh, different you know, approaches for the medical management. Now, this is not there anymore. Now, we go back to the non-invasive and the invasive, and I'm, I'm uh, just... Um, uh, Hussam has meant, uh, talked about the acute ones in children. I'm going to be, uh, be talking about the chronic ones in adults. Uh, so the chronic and the chronic granulomatous is invasive. If you go um, and see how this disease looks like in literature, you would find a little bit of difference between the, what, we, what we call the chronic invasive and the chronic granulomatous invasive. So it's basically both of them are into immunocompetent hosts. So, well, the chronic invasive ones can be also in some diabetics or low immunity, but uh, I would say in many cases just in immunocompetent cases. Uh, and um, also the second similarity is both of them are caused by aspergillus. Uh, well, this can be aspergillus fumigatus, this flavus, but then they are aspergillus. Uh, although the chronic invasive ones might be also caused by the zygomata and look like mucor, but they are chronically there. They are not like a, a patient with um, a severe immunodeficiency getting into an acute uh, fulminant invasive case. It's just a chronic uh, invasive process. And, um, and then you look into this and you see it can happen anywhere in the world. Well, well, most of the reports talking about the chronic granulomatous invasive are coming from Sudan, um, Pakistan, some, case, some areas in, in the USA. So um, in both of them, you will find the fungal hyphae getting into the tissues and um, having an angioinvasion as well. And you want to identify the fungal hyphae by different techniques. I would say the basic uh, one of these is just H and E uh, uh, sections, but you can go for the KOH. It's not very sensitive, but it, it's helpful if you have it in uh, your uh, uh, hospital lab. And then you have the PS uh, to identify the fungi, but uh, the most sensitive of these is going to be the silver stain. So, um, you know, try to communicate with lab, with your lab, and uh, just make sure that uh, you have the silver stain uh, uh, in the lab um, uh, to be able to identify this, uh, in, um, you know, with high sensitivity. Now, the, again, the chronic invasive and the chronic granulomatous invasive will look similar, that they are invasion in the tissues with angioinvasion. However, you will see giant cells and granulomas in the chronic granulomatous invasive. You know, the, the distinction between both in the response to treatment and uh, how they uh, like um, act in with the tissues is not very clear. So that's why you are not going to see a very much difference when you are talking about the clinical presentation of both of them. So basically, how the patient would present to you is just a sinus case. And, uh, you know, most of these cases just come to the clinic uh, to probably, you know, the private hospital, the secondary hospital, just come like they are CRS cases polyp cases, and you don't really know that they are something different. And then maybe the patient will get something that's, you know, will have, uh, you know, an alert to you, which is like serious anger and discharge, which doesn't happen with, with normal polyps, 
some epistaxis, which is weird, and then you probably try to think this might be something different. Uh, when you see, do a CT scan of the patient, even before getting these alarming symptoms, you can see uh, you have uh, mottled areas in, you know, in the bone with low attenuation, like you see here, there, around the, this corner, and then you probably think about something different than just normal polyps. Uh, uh, you might have something that's more alarming, which is uh, the extra sinus affection when you have the patient with orbital or intracranial complications, bilateral extension, uh, ophthalm, you know, ophthalmoplegia, craniopathy, something that tells you there's something really going on, and then it looks like malignant case. So if the patient comes to you, comes to you in this in this stage, I have seen many of these coming out. That's, this must be a tumor. And then when you take the biopsy and see it, 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 you, know, it, it you know, it comes back as chronic invasive or chronic gallium-it's invasive rhinosinocytes. Well, hopefully it's going to be good news for the patient, as I'm going to tell you right now. That's an example when you have like an extra uh, sinus affection uh, uh, with preantral uh, or periantral affection of the soft, uh, of the soft tissue. Now let's see, let's uh, go through these case scenarios. I'm going to be going with you through literature how things have changed from time to time, how how the management have evolved until we see right now in in our uh, uh, protocols. So case one in Dubai, uh, report in 2003, uh, this patient with just a huge intercranial extension of this uh, chronic invasive rhinosinusitis. The patient came with headache, vomiting. Uh, disoriented, the patient uh, was diagnosed with chronic invasive rhinosinusitis, invasive aspergillosis, and then the patient was offered endoscopic debridement uh, without really getting into that part of, of the intracranial extension. Uh, the patient also got liposomal amphotericin B. Uh, you probably don't, take, don't need to take a picture right now because this is going to change over time, so we're going to see it. So the patient got a li liposomal amphotericin B, um, etraconazole, acetazolam, well, well, um, uh, that was followed by, uh, you know, etraconazole, and then from the inter intracranial part, acetazolamide, dexamethasone, even was offered um, uh, interferon um, subcutaneous injections, and then, guess what? The patient, after three years, was cured. Now, this gives people well, we have hope with the medical treatment of these patients. So case number two, and uh, now coming from France, um, with this intraorbital extension of the uh, chronic invasive fungal. And then the patient was, again, as the last publication, was given amphotericin B, but the patient went into nephrotoxicity. They didn't, uh, they stopped it, they went for etraconazole, six, pretty, pretty high dose, 600 milligram per day, for two years, and the patient was not effective. Okay, so they had to, they replaced it by voriconazole, 400 milligram per day, and the pa for one and a half year, and the patient got cured. Now, okay, there is something. So they looked back and the, 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 uh, into the, the sensitivity. Well, amphotericin P, it was sensitive, uh, to amphotericin B, but the patient got the nephrotoxicity, th so they couldn't, co they couldn't continue. Well, with the etraconazole, it was intermediate sensitivity, so the patient didn't really, it stopped kind of the progression of the disease, but the patient did not cure. Um, and uh, the, with the voriconazole, which was, it's, it was sensitive to, the patient got, got cured in one and a half year. So now we have good news. Um, that was about, that was invasive aspergillosis. Now, this is uh, how the patient, um, how the disease evolved. As you see, this is two years post the treatment of the patient. Now, three more cases, uh, and this come in the three, the, this time, three more cases coming from Japan. Um, in this example, now they ha in, in, in this series, they have done endoscopic sinus surgery without going into the orbit, without getting in intracranially. For any of these cases, they just did, did the endoscopic sinus surgery, went for voriconazole, starting with 600 milligram per day, and then going to 400 milligram per day, PO, for eight months, uh, and then continued after that for uh, several months later. But I'm gonna show you the response in the, in the early months is 
Uh, this is before voriconazole therapy, and as you see, the intraorbital extension of the um, uh, chronic invasive fungal, and then this is with treatment after one month, after five months, after eight months. And then they continue the patient even more for uh, a year more to make sure that the patient it's not recurring. So that, that helped with an evolving approach of management of chronic invasive and the chronic granulomatous invasive fungal sinusitis. So now we are having this evolving appro approach published from Japan with this extensive uh, chronic invasion into the brain. And as you see, and the temporal loop, yeah, that, that, that's an amazing case. And when you see with this approach, uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, just removing the sinus, endoscopic debridement of the sinus part of the chronic invasive fungal, and then continuing the patient without amphotericin B, without itraconazole, just starting with voriconazole, voriconazole 400 milligram daily for one and a half year, and this is the patient pre-treatment, this is the patient post-treatment. So now we have a great, I think it's, uh, you know, I would say it's, you know, can be just much better than many of the malignant uh, tumors, so it, it's kind of good news for the patient. The largest series comes from India, uh, and in this, uh, they have, you know, I would say plenty of these, and uh, like the reporting 20 cases, uh, and I like this protocol they, they came up with. Well, because voriconazole is not really cheap, it's really expensive, and it's not really av readily available in, you know, um, so, well, if you have a patient with just a stage one of the disease where it's just into the nose, the nasal sinuses, then you, you know, do your endoscopic debridement. You can um, uh, also do the same thing for the patients that have a disease limited to the sinuses without significant intracranial or intraorbital extension where you can remove the whole disease endoscopically or you feel comfortable resecting the whole thing endoscopically, then you can give the patient postoperatively Itraconazole, that's fine. Or, all, of course, it's going to be better if it's voriconazole. However, in any partial resectable disease, you can just go for itraconazole, neither amphotericin B. You have any partial resectable disease, you have to, to go for post-op voriconazole. And this is, this the evidence is just accumulating again and again and again. Uh, so, in all their patients in the Indian series, uh, they have seen all these patients that received amphotericin B alone had residual disease or recurrent disease later. And then they were shifted to voriconazole and then they got uh, uh, the better response. Again and again, uh, from uh, Cleveland Clinic in 2016, now with six patients, multi-center study, saying the same thing, just endoscopic sinus surgery, limited to the sinuses, without, uh, you know, having the patient to go through the risk of uh, intracranial complications or orbital complications out of your procedures. I remember right now uh, a case that was presented in Chicago two years ago, and uh, the guy was presenting a really nice case of cavernous sinus invasion, intraorbital invasion of chronic invasive fungal, and we were like, we were panelists, and I was like, stop here, and just, I was just to stop and give the patient voriconazole. And you know, we just continued removing, and they continued removing, they continued removing. And the patient, guess what? Three months later, the patient died. Well, just, you know, uh, so with, with, with this approach where you do the conservative kind of endoscopic debridement or the sinus and then continue with long-term voriconazole therapy is the good way to go. So again, treatment surgical. Now choose the right antifungal. What I was talking about is invasive aspergillosis, right? Which is the most common form of chronic invasive fungal. But remember, it can be something different and it's still a chronic invasive fungal. So if I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, for example, mucor mycosis, it's going to be different. So if it's chronic invasive mucor, it's not aspergillus, then you need to choose the right antifungal treatment. And in this example, it can be, yes, amphotericin B plus posaconazole. So um, just as we saw, muco with mucor acute invasive mucor mycosis case is going to be uh, amphotericin B. While with the, with the chronic invasive aspergillosis, then you need to go for uh, the voriconazole. The take-home message of this is 
Uh, it's a conservative approach for the endoscopic sinus surgery, and it's the, so the solution for chronic invasive fungal is not just amphotericin B. No, 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 no. It depends on the fungus. If it is vori, if it is um, uh, um, aspergillosis, go for voriconazole. If it is zygu mucor, then you go for amphotericin B plus posaconazole uh, to help uh, these patients with their uh, difficult condition. Uh, the, this question comes. Whenever I finish this lecture, it's like, okay, you have talked about the allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, and I have talked about the chronic invasive rhinosinusitis. Is there any link? Can this change into this somehow? Well, myself, I have never seen it in my clinical cases. Uh, I think Amin just mentioned to me he, he saw once or twice, once, just one case over his career, one case, three cases that were changing from uh, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis to chronic invasive rhinosinusitis, I'm not sure. And the reverse. Uh, well, that, well, the reverse it seems. Okay, okay. So, uh, in literature, we we see an evidence for this. Yes, this is an invasive mycosis in immunocompetent patient with allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So it actually changes from allergic fungal rhinosinusitis into chronic invasive form. They treated the patient with amphotericin P and posaconazole in this, pay, in, in, in this example. Uh, but the, the, the other supportive evidence is that we have patients who have been diagnosed with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is the same thing that happens in the sinus, but happens, uh, you know, right now in, in, the, in, the, in the bronchi, in the lung, uh, now changing into invasive form in the lower airways, which means it can happen. Uh, in the lower airways, and it also happens in the upper airways. It's very rare, but it can occur. Again, uh, same thing. Uh, so it's just telling you that there is some link that can take the patient from this part of the spectrum into the other part of the spectrum, rare, but still there. Uh, this is our King Abdullah Medical City, where we have, um, where we have uh, you know, sub, a set of subspecialities for different uh, parts of the otolaryngology and neck surgery uh, practice. Uh, and we have got four or five cases over the past five years where I have been there in, in the hospital. Um, it's sad to say that the first case we didn't manage uh, the right way, but then the, you know, after that, uh, we are giving the patient the right treatment with um, conservative endoscopic debridement. So the first case was actually a combination between, between us and the neurosurgery, and the neurosurgeons insisted that they, they need to go in and open, just do an open approach and clear that up. The patient ended with mortality. Okay, uh, the, the four cases after that with different extensions, we, had the, we, treated the, we have treated them and communicated with our neurosurgeon team, ophthalmology team, listen, we just need to stop going after that disease and give them voriconazole and it's gonna go. And yes, uh, this is uh, Zagazi University in Egypt where uh, uh, um, I have my academic position um, and this is a global view of, uh, of uh, uh, the holy city where I have the privilege and the honor to work in and serve their people. Uh, thank you very much.